So shall I start, Jan? Are we on? I think we are on. We are all set. Participants are coming in right now. Maybe wait one more minute because they are entering the room now at the bottom you see. So welcome to a good number of enthusiasts who are connecting as we speak. Jan, you please give me the green light, then I begin. Yeah, I think we are all here. Here's the green light. Thank you all. Thank you, Felika. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and a very big welcome to all of you. Uh, this is the presentation of the 2022 review of maritime transport report. And according to uh, the authors, the true flagship of UNCTAD. So my name is Shamika Sirimana. I'm the director of the technology and logistics division of UNCTAD. So you may know that 80% of the global trade in goods is carried on ships. What some of you may not know is that the maritime transport system is a complex web of shipbuilders, ship owners, shippers, freight forwarders, seafarers, shipping lines of various kinds, the containers, dry bulk tankers. Then you have ports, the port authorities, customs and immigration authorities. You have regulators of all sorts, the transport ports, etc., And then you also have marine environmental agencies and all sorts of service providers and more. So when things are going well, we take this complex system for granted, but when things go wrong, they can really go wrong. And this is something that we have seen in the last couple of years. So this is why at UNCTAD, through the review of maritime transport report, we keep monitoring this complex maritime transport system. We flag choke points, analyze their impact, especially on developing countries, and present a set of recommendations to future-proof the maritime transport sector. So today, we have a most eminent panel to discuss the state of play of the maritime transport, share good practices and lessons, and chart the way forward. Now, I'm very happy to say that the key messages of the RMT will be presented by Ms. Rebecca Greenspan, our Secretary General of ANCA. Then we will hear from an eminent group of panelists. We have His Excellency, Mr. Juan A. Edgehill, Minister of Public Works and Cooperatives of the Republic of Guyana, a strong proponent of building capacities in ports, shipping, and trade facilitation. And Minister, I'm very happy to say that we are collaborating with Guyana already with our ASICUDA and trade facilitation programs, and we look forward to expanding this collaboration. And then we will hear from Ms. Johanna Christiansen, the CEO of Global Maritime Forum. And Johanna was this year, together with our SG, selected among the top 100 shipping personalities by Lloyd's List. Congratulations, SG. I don't know whether you knew about this, so congratulations to you too. We look forward to the continued collaboration with the Global Maritime Forum. And then last but not the least, we have Professor Jean-Paul Rodrigue of Hofstra University. Professor Rodrigue has authored seven books and countless book chapters and journal articles, but you are probably best known for your award-winning textbooks on transport geography and on port economies, both of which have been widely used across the world and us in Angtar included. So thank you for being with us. Hopefully at the end, we will have some time for Q&A via the chat function. So please post your queries on the chat. My colleague Jan Hoffman, the head of the trade logistics of UNCTAD and the team leader 
for the RMT will facilitate this session. So without much ado, I now turn to our SG, Ms. Rebecca Greenspan. SG, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Shamika. And uh, thank you to the panelists that are here with us. We are very happy to have you with us, dear minister, dear professor, dear Johanna. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to have your knowledge and your time uh, for the uh, presentation of this maritime report. Uh, you know that the review of uh, maritime transport is the uh, UNCTAD. Uh, key reports that, as Shamika said. And we know that without maritime transport, essential items like food and medicine cannot flow. Key supply chains for energy and commodities cannot function. And affordable prices are almost impossible to maintain. But for the last two years, the maritime industry has suffered from tremendous disruption. COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, climate change, and geopolitics have clocked ports, pushed up prices, and closed entire shipping roads. The logjam in global logistics has affected all of us. Those especially hard, hardest hit are the economies far from the main lines of trade. Small island developing states, landlocked developing countries, and some countries in Africa and Latin America that have also suffered. So to ensure global trade benefits all, we need to be better prepared to cope with shocks to global supply chains. We need the maritime industry to improve efficiency, invest in infrastructure, and reduce its carbon footprint. This report comes with four key messages for policymakers and the millions of people who work in the shipping trade and make the essential lifeline of maritime trade possible. So first, some important data updates. Maritime trade recovered in 2021 from COVID, but for 2022 and beyond, faces a complex operating environment fraught with risk and uncertainty. International maritime trade bounced back strongly, as I said, in 2021, with an estimated growth of 3.2%, following a 3.8% decline in 2020. Growth was driven primarily by increases in demand for container cargo. Fis fiscal stimulus packages in major economies coupled with lockdowns resulted in a high demand for goods rather than services, which drove the growth in this area. As a result, container freight rates also low rose a lot last year. Freight went up sevenfold, sevenfold between October 2019 in January 2022, affecting obviously all our goods and services coming from trade. For 2022, ANCAT projects maritime trade growth to moderate to 1.4%. And for the period 2022-2027, we project an expansion at an annual average of 2.5%. That is a slower rate than we saw three decades average of 3.3%. These projections are the consequence of strong macroeconomic headwinds. In addition, faced with rising inflation, 
consumers are spending less while also switching back expenditure from goods to services as COVID-19 lockdowns is. Geopolitical tensions and the war in Ukraine are adding to these downturn projections. And as a result of this, freight rates have also dropped since the second half of this year. Increased capacity not matched by increased demand with the onset of a global economic slowdown is a leading reason why. Also, key port bottlenecks, such as the ones that we saw in the Los Angeles port, have eased in recent months. However, container spot rate, rates are still one third higher than the pre-COVID long run average. And freight rates remain high for oil and gas tankers due to the energy crisis. We think that in the medium to longer term, freight rates will remain higher and more volatile than pre-COVID averages. Given increasing geopolitical uncertainty, extreme market consolidation, and patchy environmental regulations. I will refer to all of this in a minute. So our second message is that the maritime industry can play a key role in alleviating the current cost of living crisis. How? By helping us implement the two Istanbul grain and fertilizer agreements that we signed this year with Ukraine, Turkey, and the Russian Federation. Shipping can bring prices down and ensure the world has enough food and fertilizers next year. This is fundamental because prices are very high and we are very afraid that the crisis of affordability of today will become a crisis of, of availability in 2023 if fertilizers don't get to the countries and the small farm uh, uh, producers that need it. ANCAC, particularly our teams working on maritime logistics, has supported this initiative with data, intelligence, analysis, and policy guidance. So really, thank you all. But much more needs to be done. This review calls for stronger transport infrastructure, improved connectivity, expanded warehouses, and fewer shortages of labor and equipment. In short, we need to tackle the many sources of inefficiencies at ports and in land transport networks. This review also calls for better implementation of transport and trade facilitation solutions at ports and borders. At ANCAT, as you know, and as Shamika said at the beginning, we work very closely on facilitation through different programs on ports and customs, like ASICUDA and the Ports Management Program. These are our largest technical assistance projects going to really dozens of countries around the world. This report also calls for a faster transition to smart and green logistic systems and to widespread use of electronic documents in international trade. More digitalization is needed. All of these are solutions to reduce logistic costs, which in turn translate into lower prices for the world. This is not rocket science. Very concrete things can be realized with political will and with the necessary financing to take on board the needs of the countries to make this happen. To succeed, 
we must work hand in hand with the private sector and the international community to ensure that the necessary investments are in place. And you can count on ANCAT every step of the way, as we have a program of technical cooperation for basically every single hurdle in the supply chain, from customs to port management, from trade facilitation to data collection. Two very quick uh, more messages. First, we need a resilient maritime industry for a more resilient world. So the international community must mobilize resources for a long-term vision that promotes a resilient and sustainable maritime supply chain, especially in developing countries. The report goes in big detail, in wide detail on what do we need to do to do this better. And my final point is that we need to support the maritime industry's transition to a low carbon future. You know, we are just coming out of COP27, so we need to stress the point very much because the report shows that between 2020 and 2021, carbon emissions from the world maritime fleet rose by almost 5%. So we are heading in the wrong direction. We are concerned also because this can be even worse because of the aging ships and what that means for the environment as ships pollute more as they get older. So ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, in the panel that is coming up, we will discuss at length some of these very important issues. But I want to finish by taking this opportunity to personally thank Shamika Sidinami, my director for digital technology and logistics, and Jan Hoffman and their teams for all of their effort with the review, which remains an essential reference for the maritime industry as a whole. I leave you with a final reminder. The last two years have brought unprecedented disruption on a global scale, what we call cascading crisis. To help resolve our current crisis and prepare for the future, we need shipping and supply chains to be more efficient, more resilient and far greener. To do now that, we need to get to action now. We have no time to lose. I thank you. Thank you very much, SG, for setting the stage for the rest of the discussion and relaying the key messages of the review of maritime transport 2022, and also identifying big trends that's coming our way and how the maritime sector needs to, you know, future proof uh, uh, the, the, the sector for the good of the world. So let me now uh, turn to Minister Juan A. Edgehill, the Minister of Public Works and Cooperatives of Republic of Guyana. Minister, Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are joining this forum from. Let me first bring greetings from the South American tropical paradise called Guyana. I hope everyone listening would one day visit Guyana. It's a must. Please accept greetings from His Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, our president, and from the government and people of Guyana. Special thanks to Ms. Rebecca Ridspan, our Secretary General of UNCTAD, for this invitation to share some remarks on the occasion of your annual publication on the state of global maritime transport. Permit me the opportunity to use the next few minutes to make two main points. 
point one. I turn your attention to chapter three of the Review of Maritime Transport 2022, which discusses freight rates and transport costs. This section is of paramount importance to developing economies like Guyana, because currently our imports outweigh our exports and our consumers rely on goods from far flung corners of the world. Globalization has created a complex web within which we are woven. Both the countries on the selling and receiving end of the goods spectrum are affected, of course. However, small developing economies with little to no influence within the global shipping arena face the brunt of the challenges as we are price takers rather than price setters. The report indicated a sharp rise in TU cost over a three year period for China to South America, Santos route. It noted that in December, 2019, the average rate per TU was less than $2,000 but by December, 2020, it had tripled to 6,543. And as of December, 2021, it was 10,196. This represents a staggering price increase of 409.8% in a short space of time. While the figures as of December 2022 is not available as yet. And a decline rather than another increase has been recorded thus far following March 2022. Alarm is necessary because the, because the cost will remain above pre-pandemic levels. And it is consumers, ordinary women and men who will continue to feel the brunt of prolonged high prices through cost transference. These massive increases in price have largely been linked to the COVID-19 pandemic and are currently being impacted by the war in Ukraine. Unfortunately, least developed countries and emerging economies have traditionally and disproportionately borne the negative effects of challenges that have historically originated outside of our region. I note the individual actions taken by the United States, Korea, and the European Union to safeguard themselves against market abuse, yet towards a more equitable world, collective global efforts are necessary to safeguard vulnerable countries as well within the global shipping economy. There must be checks and balances put in place to ensure that the pricing mechanisms adheres to those specific standards with strict regulatory oversight to guard against market inequality. Moreover, UNTAD has accurately indicated that developing countries will need support to invest in more robust, resilient, and sustainable supply chains. The government of Guyana has been working assiduously to ensure we not only critique maritime transport, but we become more active players in the industry. Thus, we are leading the movement for more cooperation in the area of regional trade. Regional trade helps to promote food security, which we have seen is severely affected by disruptions in shipping routes and price increases. Goods both originating from and being delivered within the same region stand a better chance of being delivered within a timely manner at a lower cost and shorter travel routes, including a reduction in the number of cargo vessel trips. will reduce the production of greenhouse gases should the right technology trade facilitation and port management practices be put in place. Land is one of Ghana's most valuable and abundant assets. And agriculture, one of our most productive industries. 
that these are assets we are willing to both share and to leverage. During this year in the area of agriculture, Ghana has signed the Saint Barnabas Accord with Barbados to agree to the following food security measures. One, the creation of a joint working group on food and nutritional security, comprising ministries responsible for agriculture and health, state-owned agriculture and marketing corporations, and private sector representatives. We export some Guyana to Barbados of beef, corn, and soya, coconut and coconut products, fruits and vegetables, poultry and poultry products. Export from Guyana to Barbados of shade houses. Export from Barbados to Guyana of 1,000 artificially inseminated black belly sheep in tranches. Establishment of a company to manage the black belly sheep production and the creation of a youth program which includes differently able persons to work on a, on a rotational basis on, 50, on a 50 acre farm in Guyana. Lease by Guyana to Barbados of land at a concessional rate for the purpose of joint partnership in animal husbandry and poultry rearing, including poultry feed production and for production of flowers, food crops, inclusive of breadfruit, cassava planting, pineapple, bananas, passion fruit, oranges, and coconuts. To promote adherence to the CARICOM's 25 by 2025 initiative to include food security and reduce extra regional agri food imports among other measures. It is our aim to extend this to other counterparts as far as is possible. This is a monumental task and we cannot accomplish it alone. We require technology transfers as well as technical assistance in the areas of transport and trade facilitation solutions to make the suggested and necessary transition to smart and green trade logistics and to enhance our transport infrastructure, particularly our ports. My second point, I must highlight the increase in greenhouse gas emissions from 2020 to 21. Climate change is of course an issue that is of great importance to small island development states, low-lying coastal territories and developing countries. Since the negative consequences of, of shifts in climate conditions manifest almost immediately in our territories, the very sea upon which we rely to support trade, to provide our food and to support our tourism industries has become one of our greatest threats as a result of sea level rise and the proliferation of natural disasters. Guyana's capital, Georgetown, being itself below sea level, is particularly at risk. I, make, I take note and commend UNTAD's policy recommendations designed to arrest this situation, and we'll be championing them within our region. As it relates to dig digitalization and the decarbonization in particular, Ghana looks forward to both contributing to and accessing capacity building to make these changes a reality within our domain. In closing, finally, permit me to close by highlighting a small but meaningful change that Ghana has made to its customs management system to improve the efficiency therein. At the level of the Ghana Revenue Authority, we have implemented the Asikuda World Program which course is an integrated customs management system developed by UNTAD. With implementation of the Asikuda world, the Ghana Revenue Authority has strengthened the efficiency of custom operations for improved transparency through full audit trails and is working towards reform of the customs clearing procedures, among other mechanisms. Additionally, the government of Guyana is now being provided with more accurate and timely st statistics 
on foreign trade and revenue. As the Kuda world is promoting faster clearance time, as well as lower transaction costs, one of the features that is particularly beneficial to the Guyanese society is the electronic payment option for custom declarations. The Ghana Revenue Authority has partnered with the Ghana Bank for Trade and Industry, the Demerara Bank Limited, to have this facility available, which allow importers desires of utilizing the electronic payment functionality to use these e-banking services. The, this process captures the details of their declarations, along with the duties and taxes to be paid and generates a reference number. This reference number is then used when making the electronic payment. As a developing country, we believe that we could contribute meaningfully to improvements being made in the global maritime industry. We believe that small steps taken at home will lead to big impact collectively. And so we commend our, de our developing countries who have adopted a similar posture. We champion the cause of UNCTAD, providing more assistance towards helping countries who fall into this category to achieve these goals. And we, we encourage those developing countries who have not yet considered their role in strengthening the efficiency of the maritime industry to do so forthwith. We are in this together, and together we can see positive change. Thank you once again for the opportunity to share these remarks, and I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a prosperous and fulfilling New Year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for your insightful remarks. And we take note of uh, what you have said about the, how the small developing uh, uh, economies face the brunt of supply chain crisis and also so other disasters that come their way as price takers. And we heard you calling for international cooperation in several areas in technology transfer and also monitoring market inequalities that you uh, talked about in the shipping industry. So thank you so much. And we look forward to uh, deepening our collaboration with Guyana. So let me now turn to uh, Johanna Christiansen. Johanna, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for including me in this, uh, in this panel. Um, I'm very honored to be part of these discussions and, and to contribute. Um, first of all, I, I really want to thank uh, UNCTAD and, and Secretary General uh, Grinsband for the wonderful collaboration that we have between the Global Maritime Forum and UNCTAD. Um, uh, the Secretary General uh, joined uh, some a few months ago uh, the Global Maritime Forum's annual summit in New York. Uh, it was in September, um, which provides a forum to discuss many of the issues that that are on the agenda today as well. Um, some of the challenges, opportunity facing maritime trade today and in the future, and particularly an opportunity to have fruitful discussion between the private sector and policymakers on how to make the global trade system more resilient and more fair, which I think is, is part of the objective of why we are here today as well. Um, and, 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 how to, and how to make sure that that's, uh, that's true for the global trading system, for regulation, and for global supply chains as well. Um, and, and, that, and, and, to ha and how pinpoint, pinpoint also how the private sector can, can contribute to these objectives. Um, OMTAD is a key knowledge partner and, and uh, supporter, uh, not only of the global maritime forum as a whole, but in particular in the context of the Getting to Zero Coalition, an alliance of some 250 or so uh, stakeholders from across the global maritime system um, and value chains, uh, working towards making zero emission vessels uh, operating on the deep seas by uh, 2030 commercially viable. And, um, and this is this is of course a, 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 a collaboration where we very much rely on on the work and the analysis and the data collection and 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 the insights that are provided by 
and that can help inform. Uh, we had a workshop of the Getting to Zero Coalition where we had uh, participants from all over the world come together in a virtual workshop and where Jan Hoffman, who's with us here today as well, uh, presented the findings of the latest report uh, and where this really helped inform and underpin the discussions. Um, and so these are just two examples of how uh, UMTAD and the Global Maritime Forum work together and can, su can support each other with insights from private sector, insights from other stakeholders, insights from how the system is working or not working, as the case may be, and, 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 to, and, and to make sure that that is well supported with uh, facts, data, analysis, etc. Um, and we need this. And I think this is nowhere more clear than in, in the case of shipping decarbonization. As the Secretary General already highlighted, um, one of the really interesting facts that, are, uh, that, uh, that this year's report shows is around this increase in emissions from international shipping, all the while that we have set goals to decrease significantly. And in fact, um, in the context of the Getting to Zero Coalition, to entirely eliminate uh, emissions from international shipping um, by 2050, and in line with the Paris Agreement uh, objectives. And, and so to see the um, emissions rise in 2021 and by such a large percentage is honestly speaking entirely disheartening <laughs> because it's, we're, we're going in the wrong direction, right? And, and we need to turn this around. Um, I think there is a small silver lining in there, which is that the uh, emissions intensity is going on. However, most of that just has to do with economies of scale. And I think the minister already pointed to what those economies of scale, there's an interlinkage with the concentration in the sector and that this is not necessarily uh, leads to the most uh, beneficial um, um, impacts on the, on, on the global trading system. So there's a, there, is a, there, are, there are two sides to all these different, um, to all these different issues, right? And there are, there, are, there, are, there are dilemmas that are inherent in the economies of scale that, that, that lead to benefits in terms of emission, emissions, but who, that lead to negative impacts elsewhere in the system. And so we need to look at how do we address those and how do we overcome those and make sure that we, we don't see these negative impacts. Um, I think when we're particularly uh, interested in this, uh, bringing down the emissions intensity from shipping and understanding how we can do so, and have got a, a task force working that, uh, on that specifically in the context of the Getting to Zero Coalition, it is also, of course, because we are looking at the cost of shipping's energy transition as a whole. And we see this as a, a real opportunity to lower the cost of the transition as a whole and, and make it uh, less uh, costly, uh, both uh, in terms of on the sort of individual stakeholders in the system, but also on a, on a total sort of system level and to the tr uh, in terms of trade costs. So this is, this is really a, an, an area that we think it's, it's interesting to, to zoom in on and to do more work on and understand better how we can, how we can um, make shipping and the entire uh, maritime ecosystem more efficient and make trade be more efficient in that sense. Uh, the review, and Jan pointed this out in the, in the Getting to Zero Coalition uh, last week, uh, is that another key point is that uh, we can see that the fleet is getting older, the global shipping fleet is getting, uh, getting older. And one likely reason for this that we also saw, uh, that we've seen through our various engagements with maritime stakeholders is that there is a significant uncertainty in the policy landscape at the moment. Um, so one way of looking at that is that's a huge challenge and it's one that le leads to an aging fleet because many, many of the private sector stakeholders in, 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 uh, in the maritime ecosystem are holding back because of this policy uncertainty are, are reluctant to uh, add capacity um, and to order new vessels um, because there are a little bit uncertainty, uh, uncertain about the um, speed and the technologies that will support the, the shipping's energy transition, and thus this is this ha has this negative impact, right? And and it is also leading to another uh, negative impact and a disruptive aspect, which is uh, of course the supply chain crunch, if you will. Um, so we've seen, as the Secretary General also um, spoke about in her introduction, that we've seen this wave of disruptions: uh, COVID, the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, various weather events and the like that have negatively impacted the uh, maritime supply chains. Um, 
And, uh, but of course, this is only compounded by shortage of transport capacity of vessels. <laughs> so the, this sort of uh, addition of addition, uh, capacity to the system. And so one concern that we have as uh, policy uncertainty persists is that this will lead not only just to a wave uh, of disruptions and crises, but to a long-term low intensity, but very, very hard in terms of the impact uh, supply chain crisis in the long term. And this is really something that we want to want to want to, um, uh, to see how we can address. So we have a critical window of opportunity and, uh, and it was alluded to earlier in the Secretary General's remarks as well is we are just coming out of COP um, uh, where there was a lot of focus on shipping's decarbonization as well and about how uh, shipping can not only be uh, in the maritime sector, can not only be a source of emissions, uh, but also a source of solutions uh, in terms of resilience. And, and lots was uh, also already mentioned around ports, infrastructure and the like, uh, but also as a source of offtake for new energy sources that are going to power not just the shipping sector, but many other industries as well. But we have a critical window of opportunity because already this week and over the coming weeks and into the first half of this coming year, um, I, the IMO is going to set the policy, the International Maritime Organization is going to set the policy framework that will de determine to a large degree the, um, uh, the speed and the scale of shipping's energy transition and shipping's decarbonization. And that policy certainty is what we need in order for the private sector to be able to invest with confidence in adding capacity in in, um, in, in making a, a rapid and orderly transition and not to uh, incur further disruptions, uncertainties and others that have these negative spillover effects. I think one thing that we're seeing in the context of the Getting to Zero Coalition is that there is a deep recognition that this transition must be just and it must, it must be fair, right? And so really understanding and working together with UNCTAD to see how can we make that happen? So what are the sorts of policy measures that, we, that, can, be, that can be put in place in the context of the IMO to make sure that it is, that is a fair transition and, and that it is technologically inclusive, um, uh, including access to technologies and knowledge um, to those countries that need it, that it's socially just, uh, just that there's a that it's it, it takes into account um, workforce and peoples across the world and that of course that it's globally equitable and doesn't leave anybody behind so that's really where we see there's a lot of scope for collaboration with UNCTAD and for the countries that are involved in them the member countries of UNCTAD and understanding better how can how can we find the good policies that can help uh, make a, a good fast orderly transition of the maritime sector to a zero emission future and one that is 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 just and equitable thank you thank you so much johanna i think uh, the, to highlighting the gmf's effort of getting to zero emission from shipping and also your last point that the transition needs to be a just transition and this is one of the main messages of the report as our sd mentioned we ask countries to aim for a just transition towards low carbon shipping. We believe that the revenues that could potentially be generated through setting a price, uh, say for example, through the IMO negotiations that's ongoing, should support developing countries, especially the most vulnerable to absorb the transition cost and fund, fund climate change adaptation and mitigation during that transition. So thank you for highlighting this just transition as the way forward, it's very well taken. So now I move to uh, Professor Jean-Paul Rodrigue. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to, I would say, uh, intervene and provide some uh, points of view regarding this. What I will do in, in my case is uh, since uh, all the issue regarding policy and you could say trends and impact have been, I would say, very well covered so far, uh, I would like here to provide some opinion and view or about the meaning of the, the report, RNT for Academia and people involved, let's say, in research and education, which is, I would say, a very significant document. And we felt to something to acknowledge that uh, because it's uh, obviously you have a uh, lots of market for this 
you have the you have policymakers, you have uh, consultants, think tanks, and also the whole educational sector, which is depending upon this document to keep, I would say, informed about the tr latest trend. Uh, so bear in mind that this document was uh, initially released in 1968. Uh, I'm actually a little bit older than that. But still, <laughs> it is a, a very long-standing document. It's essentially an encyclopedia. People tend to forget about that. That's a document which has been there for decades, year after year, reporting, commenting about issues that the industry cares about. So let's keep uh, this in mind. And it's uh, very surprising or actually fascinating to observe the changes, the evolution of focus over the year. And sometimes it's hype. But sometimes we are talking about very deep, important trends. And some, it's sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish what is hype, which is, I would say, simply superficial. And it's a trend that goes away. And what is, I would say, something very, very deeper. So that's something I, I would like to understand, to underline about. Uh, and that's the purpose of academia, to try to say, to, to sort the level of meaning, uh, what is meaningful and what is, I would say, less meaningful. And also for us, it's, the, the report is a massive source of information, of data. Each year the report is published. What I do is I go through the pages and update my database because of, of the new data, which it's very important. And uh, some of the, of the data has been, I would say, become almost, I would say, go-to such as a, light, a liner shipping connectivity index, which is now very well-known data, used massively in research. When I peer review papers, I evaluate papers, it's a, a, a point of data which is constantly being talked about. It's now pretty rare that when you see a publication, in the, I would say, in uh, talking about maritime shipping and port where the review of maritime transport is not being sourced. So keep this in mind about the importance and maybe keep track of it to see, uh, to evaluate the impact of this document. So for us, academic, it's a very important uh, document. And obviously myself, I have the opportunity and the privilege to contribute to this uh, report over the years as a, as a data provider for, for some aspect of it. And also in terms of evaluating and reviewing chapters, which I find, I would say, very uh, fascinating. So what I've noticed over the years, or so it's a shift of focus. I remember not so long ago, uh, about, uh, it was security, you remember that 20 years ago? Security, security, and then it moved away, moved to finance, or, uh, when the financial crisis hit up. And then uh, the impact of technology, and then the discussion about economies of scale, discussion about alliances, uh, I would say. And now we move to logistics, and then we move on now to decarbonization, resilience, cybersecurity. So it's an ongoing shift of emphasis. And that's what I like about the document, it, it keeps, reporting common data, which is relevant to industry every single year. But each year you have a couple of chapters that are there. Here's what's new on the block. What's, what, what, here are the emerging issues. Here's, okay, what about, here's what about resilience about this year? Because uh, again, I, I was able to provide the, the, the report as a, one of the concerns of the, on this report, which is available in supporting documentation. So that, that what I find interesting is you have a core idea and then you switch to major deeper impact. So that's what I can say positively. Now, in terms of the issues, uh, two, two points, and that's again, not the, the, uh, the RMT's fault. It is a somewhat of a stat static document. Unfortunately, it's published every year and you have some kind of a lagging effect. And that's a problem, obviously, it's not your fault. But these days, the industry is evolving so rapidly that as a document was published, and I was there a little bit, and look what happened. Well, as the shipping race was declining, then the narrative changed. And who knows what's gonna be the narrative in five or six months, but I suspect it's gonna be a very different conversation than what you used to have over the last year or so. I, I suspect we're gonna be, again, it's maybe, a, it's, my, it's my opinion, we'll be in a situation of overcapacity and we're gonna have a very different discussion. That's what's interesting about the industry. It keeps us on our toes because of, of, of geopolitics, because of technological change. So that's one issue. Another one, which is also very complicated, is again, UNCTAD and the RNTs are involved in policy recommendation. That's the goal. Okay, you have to provide advice about where, where things are going. Uh, but what I notice is policy is sometimes a reflection of values, of what people value, what people think is important. And what, we seem to, what seems to be happening over the last few years or so is our value system is evolving and it's getting excessively complicated that bring additional values. I'm not questioning sometimes the relevance of those values, fair enough, but it's bringing additional 
I would say, components that makes policymaking excessively complicated, a quagmire. And at some point, again, again, it's, it's an opinion, so it could be subject to discussion. It could become almost unsolvable because of the conflicting value system which are being put into this. Again, it's a very complicated fine line to navigate these days. It's all about less about oh, infrastructure investment, adding capacity, integrating technology, now becomes all sort of, of, of those complex value system. And, I, I, and my point is, it becomes complexified to a point that it's almost unmanageable. Again, is it possible or not? We'll find out. Okay? And that's something that might be worth considering. And now a little bit of point about the future. Uh, what I expect in, uh, for the report in the future as an academic is it's going in that direction, more and more data. I like that. Still, I am shocked, surprised, and many people have shared this opinion about the lack of co good quality data about the industry. An example of that, because it's close to my heart, you could say, we don't have much accurate data about container port traffic around the world, comprehensively. That's shocking, particularly among small nation states. It's difficult. And sometimes we have a difficult time to, make an, to get an accurate representation of the situation. And that's a constant source of frustration. And of course, people on that are keenly aware about that and they do their best. And maybe another last point, I, I expect in the future the report might be a little bit more dynamic. Who knows? It might, instead of being a static PDF, it might become some kind of a website which is constantly updated to reflect the evolving situation uh, of the industry. Could be. Uh, one, one form of evolution. It's already, I think there you publish very nice uh, progress report with beautiful graphics. That's a very good step in the right direction. So again, thank you very much. That was my point here. I would like, uh, my point was to focus on, on the document and the report itself and what it means for uh, academia and those involved in, let's say, analyzing and producing information. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jean-Paul, and thank you so much for being a great collaborator. Uh, of the maritime work of UNCTAD and especially the review of maritime transport over the years. I know, I mean, not since 1968, but for a long years being with us. And we need you as we go forward. As you said, uh, the, the world is becoming a lot more complex, policy making becoming a lot more complex because of the divergent uh, value system. So we are entering into this, I mean, we have already entered into this difficult domain and we need. Uh, a thought leaders like you working with us. So now I would, uh, I think we have now come to the end of this session, but I think there are some qu queries. Jan, could I, I think Jan is going to lead this part. And Jan, maybe you can also uh, tell Jean-Paul that you have the, not just the book, there is a whole maritime uh, uh, transport package, which we update the data on a regular basis. I mean, you take great pride in, in developing this uh, product, Jan, you have the floor. Yeah, no, thank you, Framika. Thank you, SG panelists, uh, from Paul, Minister Edgel, Johanna, really uh, great. And, and we have a lot of interest, a lot of interesting questions. And, and yes, it's an opportunity to highlight that for us, the review is a package with the online statistics, with the country profiles, with the uh, also handbook of statistics, lots of things. I put a couple of links also in the chat to see this. Now, uh, we don't have much time left, but we had said we will uh, we will try to to pass on some of the interesting questions we got in, in the chat. So one set of questions is really about challenges for smaller shippers and the more vulnerable economies. Uh, Gottfried Smith from the Global Shippers Alliance, and I really salute and, and thank you and the Alliance for our recent future collaboration, exactly about this following topic in, in your question. It says, it is important to put in a supply chain perspective, only in collaboration can we overcome the challenges. A fair competition and balanced obligations for all supply chain partners are key preconditions here. As Global Shippers Alliance, we are working, and I may say in future and ongoing with UNCTAD, <laughs> Uh, on a charter of shippers' rights as a guideline to protect the interests of the smaller shippers. And for the audience, shippers are the cargo owners, the clients. Uh, in that same line, we have from Ziad um, Hamoui from the Borderless Alliance in Accra. Uh, here too, I want to thank uh, Ziad for the good collaboration we have in a number of initiatives in Western Africa. He highlights the need to reconfigure international shipping in order to make it more resilient, sustainable. So what needs to be done to make the most vulnerable, again, the landlocked and small islands improve their 
connectivity. And along those lines, also a third questions about lessons learned from the 2022 supply chain crisis. Moving shipping on the path to decarbonization will imply costs and higher freight rates. So the question is, what could and should be done to avoid that these cost increases fall disproportionately on the smaller and more vulnerable developing countries? Uh, uh, one more little block of questions. There were a couple of thoughts about um, the, do we have too many or not enough ships? Uh, I just try myself quickly to answer. It really depends on the time scale. Right now, there is a big order book and there is a fear that we, next year we have an oversupply. All these new container ships in particular come online. But the long term that also Johanna and, and all the panelists highlighted, there is this fear that the uncertainty leads to not as much as investment as we really need for the long term investment in ports, infrastructure, and, and trips. So there I already tried my answer to one of the questions. But if time permits, perhaps our panelists or SG can, can focus on these questions about how do we help the most vulnerable in these challenges. Thank you. And thank you to those who asked the questions. Thank you. Our thank team. you. Thank you so much, Jan. So I think what we could do is we will uh, start with the minister. And maybe minister, please share your final thoughts and also pick up on a couple of these questions. I think they were mostly, I don't know when I'm reading them, they are almost like asking you. They're all about small, uh, uh, small economies, small island developing countries, I think many of the issues that you highlighted. Well, minister, you have the floor. Thank you, ma'am. The concerns that are being raised is one that must be addressed within a particular context. And that context would mean that we have to look at where our world is going and how we want to fashion that. Profits cannot be the only thing that matters. Life must matter. And if life matters, then we have to ensure that we have food, for people everywhere. Getting food to people everywhere becomes a big issue. And I think it's there's a need, and perhaps at the level of UNTAB, for a discussion that is not necessarily in front of the cameras and for the public of how we can improve dealing with what really matters. Because while people are making profits, people are dying. While people are making profits, countries are struggling. If we go to the ground, or like we say it in our part of the world, if you walk the ground among the ordinary people and you start experiencing the harsh realities of what COVID-19 brought and the difficulties that uh, came and how people had to adjust their lives and how they were impacted by rising costs, then compounded by what's happening around the world, there'll be a little bit more compassion and there'll be a little bit more care when we are planning, when we are executing, and when we are formulating policies that will affect the global family. So I have read the concerns. I have heard the others, and I just thought that I would say that at this time in my closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Well said. I think there's a lot to th think through. Is it yet another billion to profits or life saved? I think these are very, very fundamental questions that of our time. We need to start all thinking in all our work. Thank you for these very, very wise words. So can I now move to Johanna? Johanna, you have the floor. I don't, I don't, uh, those were very wise words. I don't really know what to add to them, to be totally honest. Um, I think if there was- I should have asked the minister to come last and read the <laughs> exactly, wise words. But exactly, give him the last words. No, I just want to make sure that that's recognized. And I think if there was one thing that I might add to that is that, uh, and something that we care deeply about in the Global Maritime Forum is, can we align, align the incentives of the sector around goals that are, 
you know, that our society's goals, not the individual stakeholders' goals, right? So, so there's something about how can how can we the, uh, align the incentives, align the structures, the governance, and etc. of the sector, so that it's supportive of society's goals and and not 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 only profit maximization, which is what we see today. So I'm yeah. Thank you, Minister. That point. Thank you, thank you, Johanna. That's also you know yet another uh, wise statement. You know, how do we align? the sector's work with the society's needs. So I think these are very, very important issues. Jean-Paul, I give to you the floor. Okay, um, let's see if I can <laughs> provide something meaningful here. Um, what I think very often um, is uh, like the two previous uh, discussion I've mentioned, we're uh, in many ways, in my opinion, dealing with unintended consequences. Uh, when we talk about the rising price, uh, you know, we say you say COVID. It's not COVID. It's the response of central banks and uh, you know uh, issuing credit, money printing, and that uh, we say uh, created inflation. And uh, this this the outcome of policy tried to that we'd say cope with the with the crisis. And of course, uh, there was uh, there was less of an expectation about the consequence down the line. So that's an example of unintended consequences. You want, you're, you're dealing with a crisis, you implement policies and tools, which were financial tools. And then the two years later on, you, 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 you reap what you sow. Uh, and now we're facing uh, these, uh, these issues. Um, another unintended consequences uh, is the fact that uh, the industry was pushing, that it was facing technical change in terms of economies of scale, bigger ships. And when you create bigger ships, you create a market segmentation within the large deep sea lines, between the very big platforms and gateways around the world and the small, smaller ports. And the more you have economies of scale, the more you create a disconnection and a different rate structure. And those are on it then consequences. It's not like it's, I would say it's, it's planned, it's on purpose. It's simply a, an industry which deals with its situation, implements its strategies. And then you have these consequences that are felt in terms of price structure differentiation between the well-connected countries, which have access to a lot of traffic and the less well-connected countries. And how to deal with this, it's a complicated, obviously complicated situation. And uh, the person would be able to address that, I would say meaningfully would be a, a very wise person. And maybe it's uh, possibly not that wise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Paul. I think these are very, very uh, uh, valid issues that you raised. Uh, dear participants, colleagues, excellencies, we have now come to, we are coming to the end of our session. And I think one of the things that we are trying to say in this report is that the, the cheap, efficient, reliable, and well-connected well maritime trade has saved the world well for a very long time. That's why we have seen the growth of international trade. That's why we have seen cheaper goods coming our way. And how do we ensure that this will continue? You know, we given that this massive change is coming our way, it's about the need for decarbonization, you know, existential threat we need to address. And we are also living through a technological revolution. So the ships are going to, you know, could get bigger and bigger. And we are entering into uh, the world of digitalization. So whoever who has digitalized to a lot more competitive edge, they are to gain. So we are into a world where these big uh, shifts are happening at the same time. So what do we do? How do we make sure that the, the cheap, efficient, reliable, and well-connected maritime trade would continue? So this is the, the, the question we have in our hands. And we would also would like to uh, ask you uh, to help us with the dissemination of this uh, report. What we would want to do is to take the uh, roadshow of the report. So please connect to us and we like to talk to different stakeholder groups and have a begin a conversation. It's deep conversations that we have had here. These things need to be continued. It cannot stop here. So this is just a beginning of a journey that we really need to question the business models and the, and the you know, li alignments and our value systems and so forth, you know, for, for the sector too. So having said that, so thank you everyone and for a great session. So I'm please give a big applause to our great panelists. Thank you all.